Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. It's good to see you this morning. My name is Kate's dad. So glad that you are with us. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are glad that you are with us as well. So it was Monday morning this past week, or excuse me, Monday afternoon this past week, and I was leaving church, and I was heading home, and I needed to go to Metro Market to get one item to make dinner. I needed a red onion, so I swung by Metro Market, went in, bought my red onion, got in the car, went home. When I got home, I started to prep dinner for the night, and I started by pulling everything from the kitchen and the cupboards that I needed. I got everything laid out, and we have this cabinet where we keep all of our spices, so all I needed for um, this dish was salt, pepper, and oregano. So I go get those three things, put the salt, put the pepper down. I go to grab the oregano, and I notice there's like a pinch, just a little tiny pinch left. And I needed a full tablespoon and a half. And I was like, ah, don't you hate it when pe- people put stuff back and they only leave a little bit? It's like you go get a glass of milk for cereal or something. And it's like, ah, who did this? And I'm like, ah. It was probably me. I was probably the one who did that. And so, it, it, like, that's always frustrating when that happens. But what was even more frustrating was I was just at the store. Like, I could have bought more had I known. And so now I have three options in front of me. I, I can kind of, because that spice, like, was crucial to this dish. And I was like, I'm not going to make it without it. So I could either come up with another plan. I could either run back to the store or I could just forget it all and order dinner. So the question is, who, who would have done what? Who, who would have like come up with another plan and made something else and done that? Who would have done that? Yeah. Who, who would have like said, I'm just going to go back to the store and do that? Yeah. Who would have just said, forget it. I'm ordering dinner tonight. That's enough discouragement for me to just throw in the towel and call it a day. So I go, ah, and Becky was in the living room and she said, hey, what's the matter? And I walk out, I'm like holding the bottom, I'm like, ah, I need more oregano. So I sit down on the couch, and we're processing what we're going to do, and I look out the window, and I see my neighbor taking his trash to the curb, and I'm like, I'm going to text Alex and Clint to see if they have more oregano. Like, that's a lost art, I think, in our culture, of having your neighbor provide things that, like an egg, a cup of sugar. I do this all the time. I wonder sometimes if I'm the only person in the community where we live who's just like texting, hey, do you have this? Hey, do you have this? I think our neighbors have a running list of all the things that I owe them from all the things that I've asked for from them. Uh, But they had enough oregano, they brought it over, and it saved dinner, and we were able to like make the dinner we had planned. But, But we're always going to find ourselves in moments where we don't have enough. There's going to be plenty of times when we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time to run the errands we need to run, pick our kids up from their activities, get home and make dinner, and then get out the door to neighborhood community in time. There's going to be times when we don't have enough time. There's also going to be times when we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money to replace the tires on the car, sign our kids up for summer camp, and pay this medical bill that just showed up in my mail that day. Sometimes we're not going to have enough money. And then there are other times when we're not going to have enough food because we thought we invited five people over for dinner. One of our bonehead friends invited five more people without telling us. And so now we have dinner for 10, but we only have enough food for five. Sometimes we're not going to have enough food. We're going to find ourselves in plenty of moments where we just don't have enough. And so the question is, what do you do when you don't have enough? What do you do when you don't have enough? Whether it's time, resources, food, what do you do when we don't have enough? Well, the situation of not having enough isn't unique just to us, but the disciples found themselves in a similar situation in John 6. And there's this interaction between Jesus and a few of his disciples when there's not enough. And this interaction teaches us something about who Jesus is and how we should respond when we don't have enough. And this is how our passage begins. This is John chapter 6, starting in verse 1, and we read, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed from the far side of the Sea of Galilee, that is the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, John 6 marks a scene change in John's gospel. 
In chapter 5, Jesus was down south in Jerusalem, there for one of the, the, the Jewish festivals. And as we move into John 6, he's on the move from the south of Israel now to the north of Israel. And specifically, he's now in the region of Galilee. He's around the Sea of Galilee. He's made this move from the south to the north. And when, we're, when he's there, we're told this, verse 2, a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs. If you're somebody who writes in your Bible, circle that, underline that, make a note of that. We'll come back to that. They saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up, and saw a great crowd coming towards him. Now, Jesus has developed a reputation at this point in his ministry. He's developed a reputation of having a unique ability to heal people. Twice in John's gospel, the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus has healed people simply by speaking. He didn't even have to touch them. He didn't even have to put his hand on them. He just spoke the word, go, your son will live. And his son was healed. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And the guy gets up, picks up his mat, and is able to walk for the first time in 40 years. And so people are getting word that Jesus has this capability to heal miraculously, so they swarm him, which reveals their motivation for pursuing Jesus and the perception of Jesus, meaning they pursue him and perceive him to be a miracle worker who doles out favors for people in need. Which might make us wonder if Jesus is offended or bothered by this perception and motivation. Now, whether or not he's bothered or offended, he's, he's not surprised. Because we learn at the end of John chapter 2, we're told that Jesus knew all people. He knew what was in their hearts and he knew their motivation for following him. He, he's not surprised. He knows what's inside, and he knows our hearts. And that's not just true of the people in the scriptures who interact with Jesus. That's true of us as well. Jesus knows. He knows our hearts. He knows how we perceive him. He knows why we pursue him. He knows. He knows all things. And so the question for us is, yeah, what is our motivation? Why are we seeking to follow? How do we perceive Jesus? What do we think he's going to do for us if we follow him? Now, part of the reason why I think Jesus is not offended nor put off by these people swarming him in hopes of getting something from him is because Jesus has this discipleship strategy that he's constantly calibrating with people, and we call it the invitation and challenge strategy. He's always meeting people where they're at in a very invitational sort of way, all at the same time challenging them to follow him where he's leading them, and where he wants them to be. He's calibrating constantly invitation and challenge. I was talking about this concept with a friend a while back, and she said, oh yeah, that's exactly what I did with my brother when we were younger, and we would go to Six Flags as a family. It was just her and her brother and their family, their parents, they would go to Six Flags, and she would want to ride the big, huge roller coasters, but he was scared of them. And so she said, I always wanted to do it with him, so what we would do is we'd go to the park, and we'd look at the big, huge roller coaster, and we'd just watch it. We'd watch it do loops and corkscrews, and I'd ask him about it, and he'd be like, oh, I don't want to do that. And so then we would go and do a ride that he wanted to do, and I would be with him, and we'd do it together, and then throughout the day, we'd come back, and we'd look at this one again, and and maybe we'd look at one that wasn't as big as that one that was just like a little step below it. And she would do this throughout the day. She would invite him to try that, but then go be with him in the rides that he wanted to do all the while, coaching him, casting vision for him, inviting and challenging him to go on the big ride. And she said one day it actually worked. He got the courage to go on the ride. They did the loop. They did the corkscrew. And he got off the ride. He was like, that was amazing. But it took multiple times of inviting and challenging him 
and meeting him where he was at to bring him to a place where she wanted him to be. And Jesus does the same with us in our discipleship journey. Not so much for riding roller coasters, right? But Jesus is constantly inviting us specifically in relationship. He's inviting us into relationship with him. He meets us where we're at. And you see this at the very beginning of John's gospel. Andrew and John are kind of stalking Jesus. They're following him. They're watching him. And he says, hey, what do you guys want? And they say, Jesus, where are you staying? And he says, come, come and see. He invites them into relationship. He's inviting us into relationship. In the same way that he's meeting these crowds right where they're at for their motivation to pursue him, he's doing the same for us. He meets us right where we're at. He invites us into relationship with him. And the more we walk with him, he also starts to challenge us. He's constantly calibrating invitation and challenge. And specifically, he's challenging us to pick up responsibility, kingdom responsibility. Jesus calibrates this all the time with the disciples, and he does the same with us. And what you see in this passage is Jesus calibrates invitation and challenge with the disciples. There's three shifts that take place, both in the disciples' lives, and I think Jesus is wanting to see these three shifts also happen in our own lives. And the first shift is moving from an observer to a participant, observing Jesus' ministry to participating in it. Throughout chapter 6, there is a subtle emphasis on seeing and observing the work of Jesus. Did you notice that in verse 2? It says, they saw the signs he did. They viewed it. They observed it. And later, it will circle back in chapter 6 in verse 30. Because Jesus will challenge this crowd around the authenticity of their faith. And they say to him, oh, okay, okay. Well, why don't you do another sign that we might see and believe? And this subtle emphasis on seeing actually starts at the very beginning of John's gospel in chapter 1. Because we read in verse 14, they saw his glory. Again, Jesus says, Later in chapter 1, come and see. He says that to Andrew and John. He'll say the same thing to Nathaniel in verse 46 of chapter 1. Come, come and see. There's this emphasis on seeing in John's gospel, primarily to establish this idea of eyewitness accounts. That it's important to have an eyewitness account of the things that Jesus did so it can verify the authenticity of the work that Jesus was doing. These aren't just made up stories. There are people who walked this earth who saw with their own eyes the things that Jesus did. But Jesus, while an eyewitness account of something is great, Jesus is looking for more than just observing what he's doing. He's calling people to participate in what he's doing. And that's exactly what the disciples have done. They have already made that move from being observers to participants because not only are they coming to Jesus for salvation, but they're also following Jesus now as part of their vocation. They've left their old way behind. They're full-time following Jesus, serving in his ministry to reach out to the world. And Jesus here is calling on that participation specifically with Philip because he says to him in verse 5, then he said to Philip, right, after he looks up and sees this large crowd in front of him, he says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? So the first shift is moving from an observer to a participant. The second shift is is moving from experiencing the wonder of Jesus' ministry to feeling the weight of Jesus' ministry. Now, at some level, Philip in this moment may have been operating initially as an observer because we're told that Jesus is probably doing two things in this passage. One, he's probably healing people because that's what brought them there 
So Jesus is probably engaging with that because it wasn't uncommon for Jesus to heal people when crowds brought the lame to him. He's probably also teaching because we're told in verse 3 that he sits down with the disciples. And sitting down in ancient Judaism was the posture that a teacher would take when they taught their students. They wouldn't stand on a platform like this, but they would sit down. So there's a good chance that Jesus is healing and teaching, which means Philip at some level is operating as an observer, watching Jesus heal and listening to him teach. But Jesus then invites him to participate specifically in solving this problem that's in front of him. Hey, Philip, where are we going to buy enough bread for these people to eat? And you can see in verse 7, Philip feels the weight of what Jesus is suggesting because he says in verse 7, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each person to have a bite. Essentially, Philip is saying to Jesus, hey, there's not enough. Like, we don't have enough money in the bank to make that purchase to feed all these people. Mark's account of this same story in Mark 6, the disciples come to Jesus actually say, hey, Jesus, send these people away. You should send them away so they can go get something to eat. And Jesus looks at them in Mark 6 and he says, you give them something to eat, right? Here Jesus is inviting his disciples and challenging them at the same time. Step into this ministry with me, feel the weight of it, And take on the responsibility of the compassion and care that I have for the world. As the truth is, kingdom work can be weighty. Kingdom work at times can feel heavy, in part because there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake in doing kingdom work. In part, like eternity's at stake for people. Jesus talks about granting eternal life, that there's something on the other side of this life that we have access to if we surrender our life to Jesus. Kingdom work is weighty because eternity is at stake. Kingdom work is also weighty because in 2 Corinthians 5, we are called to be ambassadors of God, ambassadors of Christ, which means we represent Christ to the watching world. The church doesn't always do a good job of that. The church doesn't always do a good job of representing Jesus well. We are the hands and feet of Christ, and that's a weighty responsibility that we are called to represent him to the world. Now, Philip's response here, there's not enough, specifically references money. There's not enough money. We don't have enough money to buy enough bread for everybody to have a bite But that same response, there's not enough, for us can translate into, well, I don't have enough experience. I don't have enough experience for something. Or I don't have enough knowledge around something. Brian, I I don't have the ability, the knowledge, the experience, or to do the things that you are doing. Good news for you, God is not calling you to do the things that he's calling me to do. God is not putting in front of you necessarily an invitation to do what I do. He's putting in front of you an invitation and a challenge to do the things that he's calling you to do, right? It's not just about like preaching, but it's about serving in other ways in the church. And you might be saying, well, well, I don't have enough experience in in leading a neighborhood community. Like, I've, I've never done that before. Hey, I don't have enough patience to work in the kids' ministry and wrangle toddlers. I have enough time with my own kids. I don't have patience for somebody else's kids, right? I don't have enough experience or know-how when it comes to working with youth. I, I just don't have enough. But it's not even the call to participate in church-sponsored activities. It's also the call to witness and reach out to the world, namely your neighbors. And I would argue you do have enough experience, knowledge, and know-how to do that because it starts with building relationship. It, It starts with finding unique ways to love the people who live right next door, the people who work in the office next to you, to serve them, to care for them, to have compassion even when you feel like you're 
tapped out. And here's the good news. In this moment, Jesus is in full control. Jesus is in full control. He knows exactly what's going on. We're told this in verse 6, because verse 5 we're told that Jesus responds or asks Philip, hey, where are we going to find bread for these people to eat? Verse 7, Philip responds saying like, we don't have enough. There's not enough money for anybody to eat. And right in between, we're, we're told this in verse 6. He asked this only to test him. It's just a test. For he knew already, he already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus was in full control, knew exactly the situation, knew exactly how it was going to be solved. But he invites Philip in to feel the weight of kingdom ministry, kingdom responsibility. One of the things that I love about being a dad is being kind of that weird, awkward dad that makes my kids squirm at times. Like sometimes it's with dad jokes Sometimes it's doing embarrassing things out in public. I just like a couple weeks ago, there was like an all Tosa uh, choir concert thing that was happening over at Tosa West. And one of our daughters was singing in it, and I was sitting on the gym floor. Like, you know, there's like hundreds and hundreds of people packed into this gym. There's parents sitting on the bleachers, some on the floor. All the kids walk in, and as soon as I see my daughter, I pop up from my seat. I'm like, hey, sweetie! How are you? I'm like blowing kisses. You're going to do great. And she's like, oh my gosh, dad. Oh my gosh. So she goes, she's, I'm on the floor. Like they have um, students on one side up on the riser, students on the other side up on the riser, students on stage and in the middle of singing. And it's wonderful. When it's her turn to sing, I pull out my phone and I start filming her. And she can see that I'm filming her. And I'm just like, yeah. and she keeps looking at me. She keeps looking at me and she goes, stop it. And I'm just like, you know, I, I love that stuff. One of the other things I do with my kids is like when we go out to eat or when we go to Starbucks and we get to the register and they're like ringing us up, I'm like, who's going to pay for this? Like, like I, don't have, I don't have my wallet. And they just kind of like roll their eyes because they know, right? When they were younger, I can still remember the first time I did that to my oldest daughter. I was like, oh man, do, do you have any money? Like, do you, and she's like, she just looked at me like eyes big and wide, like, like, what are we going to do? No, I don't have any money. I'm four years old. And I'm like, ah, I'm just kidding. I got it covered. Now when I do it, they just roll their eyes because they know. Like, they've been through that little joke enough times. They know dad's got it covered. They just know that dad's got it covered. Dad's not going to lead us into a situation or bring us into a moment where he doesn't know how we're going to resolve that moment because dad knows because dad's in control. It's the same with Jesus. Jesus knows. He knows exactly what he's going to do. He's just testing the disciples in this moment. Namely, Jesus is testing them to increase their trust in him. It says that he's testing Philip he does the same to us. He invites us into relationship. He invites us to participate with him. He invites us to feel the weight of what he's doing. He challenges us at times to engage in it, specifically to increase our trust in him. Jesus tests us to increase our trust. And when you say yes to Jesus, when you do trust him, when you step into situations that might stretch you, you experience the third shift. Not only do you go from an observer to a participant, not only do you move from experiencing the wonder to feeling the weight of his work, but you also move from a consumer to a contributor. See, the people who are coming to Jesus in this moment are looking to consume. They're hoping to get somebody healed. They're hoping to hear something encouraging. They're coming in order that they can consume. They want something from Jesus. But there is one among them who has a different mindset, and it's not who we might think it would be. We're told this in verse 8. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? So Philip is overwhelmed in this moment. Jesus says, where are we going to buy food for everybody to eat? And he's like, ah, I don't know. We don't have enough. 
Andrew here is doubting, right? He actually tries to engage in the problem and actually solve it, but he's doubting, like, this is what we got, but I don't think it's going to be enough, Jesus. I don't know how far it will go, which is interesting because they've already seen Jesus perform miracles. They've had a front row seat to Jesus heal two individuals. They also were a part of the wine to wa- the water to wine miracle, tasting this best wine they've ever had that came from water. They've seen Jesus do amazing things, but it's this young boy whose name we're never told, we know nothing about him, who has this brown bag lunch that his mom probably sent with him for the day, and he says, hey, I've got this. I can help and offer this. And what he brings isn't much, not just in quantity, but also in size. Did you notice it? He had five small barley loaves, two small fish. What he has is seemingly insignificant. And Andrew knows this, like five small loaves of bread and two small fish are not going to feed 5,000, we're told in coming verses. There's thousands of people there. But notice two things about this boy's contribution. One, he gives for a larger purpose. He gives for a larger purpose. He gives this little that he has to a greater cause. And I don't know about you, but I want my life to have an impact for something larger than just my life. I want my life to count for something larger than just being comfortable and happy with what I have. I want my life to count for the greater story of who God is and what he's doing in the world. And so I'm giving my life to that. You see this little boy giving what he has for something larger, for something greater. And the second thing is he gives everything that he has. He could have have said, hey, here's four barley loaves and here's one fish and hold some back for himself. But he gives everything that he has. He holds nothing back, which means everybody has something to give. Everybody has something to give. And you might actually be in a season where you have a lot to give. You might be in a season of life where you've lived a long life. You have tons of experience because you've been through hardships. You've endured them. you persevered through them. And now looking back on life, you have all of this wisdom because of the life you lived. You might have a lot of wisdom and experience to give. You also might have a lot of time because you've raised your kids, they're out of the house, you've now retired, and instead of spending your life playing golf in Florida, maybe you have time to give to the greater work of God in our community and in the world. Some of you have a lot of resources to give, because God has blessed the work that you have done, and you're now at the end of your life, and you've just seen God's blessing grow and grow and grow, and you have lots of resources to give. Some of us here this morning have a lot to give. Others of us this morning may not. It, it could be because of the season and stage of life we're in. We, we don't have a lot of time. Like you're trying to like every day wake up. How do I do this? How do I live this life? I have no idea what I'm doing. I need all kinds of help. You don't have experience or wisdom. You also may not have a lot of time because you're chasing your kids everywhere they're going and you're just busy, busy, busy. And you may not have a whole lot of resources because you just haven't got to that point in your life yet. You may not have a lot, but what this passage invites us into and challenges us on is no matter what you have, no matter how much or how little, everyone has something to contribute to what God is doing both in our church and in our community and in the world. And maybe the most important thing that you can give is your faith, is your trust. That will come up again later, again, in chapter 6. Because Jesus is saying to these crowds, do the works that God requires. And they respond to him, okay, tell us what that is. Tell us what the work that God requires is, and we'll do it. He says, the work of God is this. It's to believe in the one that he sent. Believe. Have faith. Put your confidence and your trust in him. Perhaps the most important thing that you can contribute is your trust 
And Jesus tests us in order to increase our trust. Now, trust and faith here isn't intellectual agreement to some idea. Trust and faith is putting that idea into reality. So it means specifically that our trust should look like having confidence that God can use what I bring, no matter what it is, that He will use what I bring. So therefore, it should motivate me to contribute to the work that God is doing. It's also trust that God will provide what I need. So I can give, I can contribute, even if it feels like I don't have enough, because I can trust that God cares for the birds of the air, and He cares for the flowers of the field, and they are way more, uh, we are way more precious to Him than those things. And if He cares for them, He will also care for us, so therefore we can give and contribute, whether it's with time, expertise, or resources sacrificially because we know that God will provide everything we need. And then lastly, it should be trust that somehow, miraculously, even if I don't bring much, God can multiply what I give. Because that's where this story ends, verse 10. Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely, this is the prophet who has come into the world. See, the result of this moment is when Jesus operates in this way, it helps us see who he truly is. And as he's inviting us in to participate in his work, as he's challenging us to feel the weight of kingdom responsibility, and as we say yes and move forward in faith, we further see just how awesome, magnificent, and powerful He is. But sometimes in order to see that, it means we have to take a step of faith to move towards that. And so the question for us this morning is, where is God inviting you? Where is He inviting you into deeper relationship with Him? He's saying this morning, okay, maybe you're coming with skewed motivation. Maybe you're coming just to get something. Maybe you're hoping that I'll dole out a favor to you. But he might be inviting you to move beyond that, to make another sort of commitment in your walk with him. Where is Jesus inviting you in some subsequently, where is He challenging you as well? Where is He challenging you to step in and feel the weight of the responsibility of following Him? To move from just simply experiencing the wonder of His work to now feeling the weight of it and say, I want to participate in this because I know that there's something amazing in front of me that Jesus is doing that I want a front row seat to. And where is he challenging you to move from being a consumer to a contributor? Where is God challenging you in your walk? Maybe it's to do something here. Maybe it's to contribute some way in this building project. Maybe it's simply inviting a friend to church with you. Inviting your neighbor to come and see what God is up to. My hope and my encouragement is that you will see that what Jesus is doing with the disciples in calibrating invitation and challenge is the same work He does with us. He's calibrating invitation and challenge with us all the time. The question is, do we have eyes to see it? Are we willing to participate in it? And the good news of all this is that Jesus is in control of it all. Like, He doesn't need us but He invites us into it. And He's inviting us into something that He's already done, meaning He's not putting something in front of us 
that he hasn't done himself. And what we have before us this morning is the communion meal, the Lord's table, which highlights just how much Jesus has given for us. Because we might think, well, Jesus owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's not much for him to give anything, except that he gave his life. He gave his life for us so that we might have salvation, so that we might be able to spend eternity with him, so we might have access to that eternal life now. And so this meal before us this morning is an invitation. It's an invitation to further and deeper relationship with him, but this meal before us is also a challenge. It's a challenge in that by coming up and taking hold of this meal, you're saying, yes, Jesus, I will step in as a participant. I will move from being a consumer to a contributor. I will say, yes, I will count the cost. I will follow you wherever you go. I will participate in your work and even do it sacrificially if needed. And so this meal this morning stands as an invitation and also a challenge. Our encouragement to you is to come forward, but know what you're coming forward to. You're coming forward to a sacrificial life of following Jesus wherever he leads. And so in just a moment, our ushers are going to come forward, and they are going to dismiss you row by row to come up and take some of the elements. Uh, What you're going to find in these four stations is that the two middle ones are the same, the two outside ones, that all the big silver plates are the same. There's two cups stacked on top of each other. Find a piece of bread in the small cup, a cup of juice in the top cup, and you can take those. In the middle, we have prepackaged items. If you're looking for a gluten-free option, that's in the bowls on the outside tables. So when our ushers dismiss you, we invite you to come to the middle row or through the, the middle aisle to grab the elements, return to your seat through the side aisles, and then when everybody has the elements, I'll come up forward and I will lead us in taking them together. So pray with me before we go before the Lord's table. Lord, we thank you so much for what you have done for us, for how you have given sacrificially on our behalf, that we might know, that we might see, that we might believe and ultimately take a step of faith to follow you and to give of our life and of ourselves to the work that you're doing. We thank you for the death and resurrection of Jesus and how it's making all things new. We, may we never take that for granted and live accordingly to that story. We pray this in your name. Amen.